Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this fourth in a series of uh, live webinars for the Brumwood Works Spark program. My name is Dan Martin, so I'm from Enterprise Nation, which is the partner of this program. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Brumwood Works is a commercial property company based in Manchester, Cheshire, Leeds, Liverpool and Birmingham. And the Spark program is primarily aimed at supporting Brumwood Works uh, business, 3000 plus businesses across their buildings. But these webinars are open to everyone. So thank you so much for joining us. If you are a Brumwood Works customer, there are also some specific exclusive services that you can access as part of the programme. There's Spark Advisors, where you can speak one-on-one -on -one to business advisors, and Spark Connections, where you can make useful curated connections. So for all of the information about the programme, go to brumwood.co.uk forward slash spark, but don't do it yet because we've got a webinar to do. So this week, we're talking about how to start a brilliant and grow a brilliant food and drink business. So obviously, lots of food and drink businesses have been trading during these times in various parts of uh, the country. Food and drink businesses are about to reopen. So it's a very timely chat. And we'll be getting going on the conversation so uh, very shortly. But if you've got any questions while we're chatting, do post them into the question box, which you can see on your screen, and we'll get over to them uh, at some point later on. First of all, I'd like to introduce Chris Middleton from Brumwood Works. So, Chris, do you just want to introduce yourself and explain a bit more about what you do? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so, I work in the uh, Brumwood Works retail and leisure team. Uh, so, collectively, Brumwood Works owns and manages close to four and a half million square foot of workspace and retail space across Manchester, Cheshire, Leeds, Liverpool, and Birmingham. Uh, I guess the key focus for the retail team, therefore, would be to create places through the mix of retail and leisure that we bring to those areas um, and in doing so we can make those areas more desirable engaging uh, which not only benefits the office customers uh, but also supports the goal of sort of creating thriving cities um, we've also got action athletics which is home to over 80 independent food uh, and retail traders uh, and more recently we've moved into the world of shopping centres as well uh, following the acquisition of Stratford Moor and Sanford Quarter which was in partnership with Traffic Council last year. Um, so across the board really we're working with food and drink businesses of all shapes and sizes, um, small independents, bars with one site, established regional operators uh, and they're right the way through to brands that have expanded globally as well. Fantastic. Lots to talk about there. We'll get on to a bit more about that later. But Clive, uh, you're with us. You're from the Food Agency. Do you want to just briefly talk about what, who are and what you do? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Hi, everybody. Um, I, uh, my web profile tells me that uh, I've been in the food and drink industry for 35 years. Well, I haven't changed that for the last five years, uh, so it's a little bit more than that now. Um, I've got a family uh, dairy background for four generations and prior to that in farming, so we've been attached to the food industry for very many generations, um, I moved into the family business processing tens of thousands of uh, litres of fresh milk and chilled juices a day. And in the mid 90s, uh, moved away from that to a chilled food manufacturer, supplying the multiple retailers and uh, food service industry across the UK with uh, chilled ready to eat foods and, and some bespoke uh, products for some of the, the major uh, food service company, companies in the UK. And we sold that in 2012. and. Um, Got a little involved with sustainability and such, but uh, all the meanwhile, people were phoning up saying, Can you help? Uh, I've got these ideas, food industry, can you come and uh, help me sort of uh, grow the business? And uh, the food agency was born, having met uh, my business partner, Jeremy Chaffe, who was running a, his own food manufacturing. He called me in and um, he was a sales and marketing arm, and I'm, if you like, more of a pop up MD, as I call myself, or an <laughs> director. And uh, I, I got one of the best jobs in the world. I get, I get to help people realise their dreams and aspirations, grow their food businesses. Fantastic. You must get a lot of samples, don't you? Too many. That's why you can only see me from these shoulders up. <laughs> yeah, if you want to send any over, you know, well, we'll talk about that later. Uh, but so this, just to get started, we're going to have a quick chat amongst ourselves. I've got a few questions I want to ask. But as I said, it's all about you watching. So if you've got any questions about your own food and drink businesses, whether you're starting them or you're uh, growing them at the moment, post them into the chat box. We'll talk about them in a bit. So first of all, just generally to set the scene for both of you, what, what do you believe are the key things behind a successful uh, food or drink business? Well, well, I, me to go first, Dan? Go for it. Um, well, I, my opinion of that changes. Uh, I've been doing this um, now for uh, eight or nine years, and each year it adjusts slightly. And uh, I would suggest there are four component parts, and the most important part is the person. 
people who I've seen succeed have uh, an enthusiasm bordering on an obsession and uh, you just can't help but lean into them and engage with what they're doing. So you can tell, uh, I can tell when people approach me, when they get that slightly craziness uh, that they, they've got something which is going to go go somewhere. There are so many hurdles uh, to overcome, so you've got to be so resilient. And that enthusiasm will get you through many, many of those those hurdles. Having the right amount of money for your aspirations, that dependent on the, a lot of people um, go in um, uh, bootstrapping. I haven't seen very many successful companies bootstrap, so working out what your aspirations are and funding that accordingly is, is, is entirely important. Um, third thing I would suggest is that um, uh, don't make what you like or what your neighbours like or what your partner tells you is good. Make the products that the consumers want and you have to find out what they want by some good bit of market research and good bit of data um, and, and go and ask them what they want. Don't assume you know. And probably the most important component, number four, is a little slice of luck. Uh, you've got to be in the right place at the right time. So you, you, we, 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 we tell everybody how clever we are expounding theories on growing food businesses, but sometimes that little bit of luck, but uh, you know, you've know, you got to put yourself in a position to, to maximise that luck when you get it. Yeah, brilliant. That's great. Um, Chris, what would you say? You know, you work with lots of foodie businesses. What, what are the sort of key successes that you see? Yeah, well, I mean, I wouldn't disagree with any of the points Clive's raised, but also, and I think touching on what he said, authenticity is the big one for me i think so you know the decline we've seen in the casual dining sector over the years has been because there's been a lack of authenticity a broad brush approach you know you're trying to appeal to the masses and i think certainly you know the independents that just start out tend to have a very clear idea of what they want to achieve and with that they've got an authentic product they should know what gap in the market they're looking to fill and i think then that authenticity and you're offering something unique that customers want sets you apart from others. Mm. So yeah, I was going to get onto that about the the, 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 the startups, the ones in who watching who are looking for start. So you've covered that authenticity and stuff. What are some of the other things, staying with you, Chris, top tips for people that are just thinking about starting? I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things to consider and I suppose it's at what part of the journey you're in. Um, some of the people we work with at Hatch are, you know, one of the biggest challenges they face is making that step from, you know, they traded all across the country at events and festivals, doing pop-ups and regular markets, but what's the next step in terms of getting your own front door and having more of a fixed base so that you can serve your product to, you know, customers on a regular basis? And that can be quite a daunting next step. Um, I think what we've tried to do at Hatch is provide space that's almost like plug and play. So you arrive, your till system set up with your menu on it, you've got kitchen extraction already ready to go. Um, the license is a short term, it includes, you know, your your rates, your service charge insurance. So what, the, what those guys then can do is focus on what they're good at and what they're passionate about, which is serving great food and drinks to people. Mm -hmm. um, what about you, Clive? Because obviously you said you're, you're all about the people with, with the food products that would then, you know, provide some of the businesses that are in the, the Brumwood work spaces. So what, what sort of tips do you give to people starting out in, in the industry, particularly around actually getting the products actually made to start with? Well, rather before that, Dan, um, I, one of the first questions that, uh, that I ask uh, people who approach me is about their careers, what they enjoyed doing in their careers so far, because it's, it's very important that the, the, entrepreneur, the entrepreneur knows what they're good at what they're good at is what they're going to enjoy doing and that's going to sustain their business through some tough times and it's also equally as important to know what they're not good at so they can go and ask um, to get help too many people try and do too many things and certainly in the food industry there's quite a lot of disparate skills required from tech legal technical sales marketing whatever that might be and you can't do all of it you have to get some specialized help so knowing where you fit in the value chain, everybody who uh, adds value to a product, all the way from the farmers through to the poor, um, they, they, they all do something to add value. So you have to identify what your skills are, put yourself in that value chain. Often it's the case that the, the entrepreneur is very good at sales and marketing and maybe food made for them, uh, but they have to realize that that's the role they play in the value chain. Uh, and then if you know what role you're playing in the value chain, you know what percentage of the, the profit you can take out of the retail price. Uh, if you're manufacturing it, you can actually get a larger piece of the piece of the profit. If you're sales and marketing, you, you, you only get a much smaller part. So knowing where you fit in that value chain is, is really important. And, and really, um, 
the other thing I would ask of people is to um, work out what their, their one, two, three steps are in expansion. Start uh, to, with a program that you can afford, that the investment matches, but always dream big, always have stage two to, 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 to strive towards, whether that might be going out of your own commercial kitchen into a larger space or getting a contract manufactured, and then and dream even bigger and say, right, in two years' time, we're going to be at stage three. So, so each each action you take along the process feeds the, potentially the next stage, so there's no waste in the, in, in the process. Mm, fantastic. Um, just coming back to you, Chris, on, you said, you know, the right space and what you're trying to do at at Hatch, but you know, for businesses that need the space, it's so important they get the right one. So, what are your tips for finding the right space that fits your brand, fits your vision, and like, you know, what what are the factors that can you know make or break the, the perfect space? I think, I mean, ultimately, it depends on the product, and therefore, it's not, it isn't one size fits all. So, you know, you need to know exactly what it is you're doing and 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 who it is you're going to be serving. So, if it's uh, if you're a high volume, fast turnover business, then you're obviously going to need to look for locations that have got high footfall and that you can service that demand throughout the day. If you're destination dining, then being off the beaten track may not actually be a bad thing. You know, so long as customers know what your brand proposition is and know where to find you, then that in itself is a is a USP. Um, and I think for others, like at Hatch or even in places like Ancoats, where that's established itself as a, you know, a a prominent culinary district within the city being there i think each business benefits from the ecosystem of one another and as long as they're not overlapping and, and sort of competing then being within an ecosystem of like-minded businesses is always helpful as well mm. i guess there's such a particularly maybe even increase this time there's such an interest in supporting in independent local businesses i guess isn't there and obviously if they're all together that really helps to like you say, the ecosystem, they all thrive together and support each other. Um, I guess that's the sort of vision behind Hatch, isn't it? Those kind of places. Exactly, yeah. It's it, it's almost like a sort of built-in support network, not just through the team that we've got on the ground there, which are helping with operations, events and marketing, but also being next door to like-minded individuals that are you know, trying to achieve similar things to you. They've got the same questions. And it also it can help with footfall as well. If you create a destination that's got multiple sites and multiple reasons to visit, then it, it, it in turn obviously generates more footfall as well. Mm, exactly. Um, just coming back to you, um, Clive, on, I know this will be a question that a lot of people are interested in. How, once you've got your product, how do you actually get it stocked by retailers? So some of the, the businesses that Chris works with and other ones, what are your tips for getting into retail? Well, the, um, yeah, the... Uh, Main key is you uh, these days you've got to create an amazing story. Brand strategy is everything. Brand strategy has increased in importance over the years. Back in the day, you used to be able to come up with a, uh, a great tasting food and the reasonable uh, the package at a reasonable price, and that would get the interest of buyers. But now, if you haven't got a, a really uh, engaging brand story uh, behind that, you're unlikely to get noticed. Um, so, creating an amazing story again with that enthusiasm for me is is, is really key. Um, getting noticed by the retailers, be the expert. Um, there was one of the head buyers from a premium major retailer um, said that she doesn't want to answer your questions about products. She wants you to tell her where the product's going to go on the shelf, what the competition is. She wants you to tell her what product she's going to have to take off the shelf to put your products on there. Um, so you've got to be pretty, pretty brutal. You've got to be, be the expert. You've got to uh, know exactly where your product goes. Uh, you've got to know everything about it, shelf life, nutrition, how it travels, the logistics of getting it there. Basically, before you sit in front of a, a buyer, you've got to know all the questions they're going to ask you, and you've got to present them in a very efficient way. You don't get a second bite of the cherry now. If they, if, if they don't think you've got the right answers, you're unlikely to get this. So, and of course, knowing the competition, where your product sits against them is absolutely key in that process. Not just not just price, but uh, where does it sit? Is it chilled, ambient, frozen? Is it premium value, free from? Is it organic? So just be absolutely expert in, in where your product is. Um, and really, it also it extends to knowing the logistics. Know the logistics of people you can speak to. Um, but know how to, how to get your product to them before you sit in front of them. Um, they, you don't want to be asking questions. They don't want to do your work for you. Uh, they just want to. Uh, the buyer wants to look good. They want to increase sales. They want to uh, impress their purchasing director. And you don't want to put too many problems in their way. You want to or give them solutions all the way down the line. 
Mm, exactly. That's that's really, really good advice there. And um, we've got loads of questions coming. Let me just add one more thing, by the way. Perfect. One of the frustrating things for the new businesses when you're presenting your fantastic products and package in front of the buyer, they're often thinking, "This is great, but what has the business got next? What's going to happen in six months' time? What's the product development strategy? What's going to happen in twelve months' time?" Because because the buyer, it's a lot of time and investment for buyers to to take on new 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 suppliers, and they're going to want to a longer term project than just going in with the, your fantastic new idea. Mm. Brilliant. Cool. Um, we've got lots of questions coming in, so I'm going to cut to the questions. So uh, we've got about half an hour left. So if you've got questions, post them in the chat box like some people have. Um, there's a question for you here, Chris. Um, Alison has asked, do you think now is a good time to look at taking on retail premises or would you wait a while to see which businesses don't renew their leases? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I don't think now is a bad time. Certainly, you know, there's, there's obviously been some change in activity over the past few months and everyone's going to be monitoring the situation constantly to see what happens but in terms of the the conversations we're having with people people are sort of they're very much focused on what's what's after this and the recovery and it could actually be a good time to to get into it and you know new ideas and concepts as as, as i say are always um always welcomed and i think you know you've got things like the business rates holiday which people can benefit from until i think it's due next year now um so that's another that's one of your fixed costs that you can um that you, you won't be paying to to begin with so it's definitely not a bad time uh, but I, I suppose monitoring the situation is obviously the, the right thing to do as well mm, exactly um Alison, if you're still on let, let us know where you're based and what if there's a specific type of retail place you're looking for might be able to help with that um this is a very very specific question but i'm going to ask it anyway it might have some general advice and possibly more one for you clive and i'm not sure i'm going to, be able to pronounce the first bit but i want to know key regulations for nutris osmetics which is edible beauty supplements um have you ever designed uh, any beauty supplements and this is quite a direct thing from dina if if yes can we discuss our formulation with you now i know that's very specific but uh, i suppose that raises a question around uh, a new industry and knowing regulations and food safety stuff so is there anything you can offer advice there on that Clive, generally or particularly about that type of product i think most people can see that i haven't been involved in beauty products all my life <laughs> so that as you say that is a very specific question well, we're always happy to signpost people uh, to, uh, to people in our network. Having been in the industry for many years, if I can't answer a question, I'm very happy to take a message and, and point people in the right direction. So I will be someone who can be that way. Well, just generally, though, on that question around regulations for food and drink, is that is that any have you got any advice on that? Well, it's, obviously, that's a key thing you need to think about when designing certain products, I guess. I think uh, if we take uh, first first thing about regulations is it's all out there and available. The second thing is plagiarise, because there are many, many companies, good big companies, who spend many, many millions of pounds getting the legals right. So just the supermarket with a similar product and, and plagiarise. But um, the third thing about regulations and, and testing and what have you, uh, I get a lot of people come to me and say, um, can you advise me where I send my product for, for microbiological testing? And often it's way too early in the process that they're ready to spend a thousand pounds when they really don't need to. So the thing is, uh, on the broad subjects of legislation, yes, there's a lot of lots of hoops to jump through. But um, speak to people like me who can who jump through those hoops many, many times. It's very, very easy, and ultimately, um, you can save a lot of grief and, and a lot of wasted time, and, and hopefully a lot of wasted money. Yep. Fantastic. Well, um, Dina, we'll try and uh, drop Clive a line afterwards. He might know somebody that can help with your very specific question on uh, beauty, edible beauty supplements, which does sound quite intriguing. Um, there's some more questions coming in. Let me just go to, oh, there, I think it was you, Clive, possibly both of you that's talked about knowing what people want when it comes to designing, a, this is all types of sectors, but specifically in food. So Carol has asked, what do you suggest is the best way to ask people what they want? especially in the current climate with all of the uncertainty. So I guess that's around market research and specifically right now. Entirely. Um, market research is, in, again, entirely dependent on the size of your aspirations and budget. Um, for startups, I would suggest, and I've said this many, many times, there are 50 people in your network, try and get the right kind of demographic that suits your product type um, and standard, standardize the questions that you possibly can 
Um, people often don't, and of course the, the one thing is you don't need to be asking people who've got a vested interest in it. You don't want to hear, yes, it's fantastic. You want to, you want to have um, rather more generic uh, or uh, targeted questions than that. The one little um, story about research, I was lucky enough to be involved with um, one of the uh, BBC Street Food Award a few years ago. And uh, they were selling their wares in a very well-known market in, in, in London. And um, I said, they were a little bit um, amateur. And I, said, I said to this guy, you really do need to get some market research. And he looked at me over his, his stall and said, I, can't, I haven't got the money, I haven't got the time to do market research. I said, you're in a market. Ask them what they think and write the results down and record the results. And there's your data. That is market research. So it doesn't have to be big and expensive. It just has to be standardized and try and get the questions across the demographic of the people that your food and drinks are going to. Yeah. Isn't it that, is it innocent smoothies, that famous story? Was it at Glastonbury where they had two, they had two, two flavors and there was two buckets and you, and they, they gave out testers and you had to, which one you liked, you put in a different bucket. And apparently that was how they tested their early smoothies. I think that was a story I read. It might be, it might be fake, but that could be an idea to do it. Um, We've had a, a really interesting question on uh, from, from Alison again on, um, do you think that home deliveries will still be as popular when we go back to normal, normal in quote marks? I don't know, perhaps something, Chris, you could talk about, like what some of your business has been doing when it comes to delivery. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's always going to be, I think now more than ever, it will remain a, a larger sort of portion of the sales that these businesses are doing. Um, certainly during the period where we were completely locked down, it was the only source of income for some businesses. Um, and, you know, we're, we're gearing up to getting Hatch reopened to the public as of this coming Saturday. But before that, for the past couple of weeks, uh, we, we got it set up to do this click and collect and, uh, you know, food takeaway service as well. Um, and so I don't see that going away. I think it's all, it always was important. It's probably now going to be, a, you know, even more important going forwards. And it's just, I think, these businesses, you know, they need to get operationally set up to be able to cope with the demand that will be a mixture of on-site and off-site sales. Mm. Yeah, and I've, I've spoken to lots of businesses who've never, who have never delivered and now they are and actually they found it works quite well for them. It's re they've reached new customers, you know, it, and there's all sorts of solutions. There's obviously the obvious home delivery things, but there's a lot of other solutions that have come out haven't they, in these times to help businesses deliver. So I think it will continue. I, I know I've certainly ordered a lot of stuff delivery. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think we all have. Um, there's a, again a question around, I don't know if either of you can answer this, but um, it's asking about a liability insurance. Would you recommend a liability insurance company for a curry powder business? We're really struggling to get one. I don't know if that's something either you can help with in terms of finding a, an insurance company for a food business. Uh, yes, um, I'm not going to recommend it, recommend it in the weekend, but certainly would happy to point someone in the right direction uh, uh, aside from this webinar. <laughs> <laughs> okay, get in touch with Clive. I mean, I mean is that? Is that neutral here then online oh exactly i thought you'd say that uh, in terms of that with things like that with you chris i guess the businesses that move into your space is that something you expect them to have done you know any sort of liability insurance or something before they move in that sort of, sort of thing they need to do themselves is it yeah exactly hmm. so uh, marie that's from marie so get in touch with clive afterwards see and he might have a recommendation for you um let's go through there's loads of questions coming in i'm going to quickly go through them um george has asked for a spirits brand starting out would you recommend keeping sales in-house or going towards a marketing distributor as your main route to market that's probably one for you clive just uh, run that past me again I didn't quite get that uh, for a spirits brand starting out would you recommend keeping sales in-house or going towards a marketing distributor as your main route to market um the it, again, it depends on aspirations. Um, I think that uh, if it's a small startup, then try and find the route to go straight to consumer as much as you can to get the full uh, profit margin uh, from from retail price. Once you start going through wholesale distributors, then your margin will decrease. Therefore, your turnover is going to be significantly higher. Therefore, your costs of uh, warehousing and distribution are going to go up. Um, so. A, a small startup, I would encourage them to find whatever route they can to go direct to consumer, and there's, that, that's online sales, whether that's um, food markets, so that you're getting full profit margin. 
then of course um, that should give you the launch pad and the marketing data to then expand into wholesale distribution uh, as you go forward. So uh, it depends how quickly you want to go from zero to 100 miles an hour. If you've got plenty of cash, um, then by all means go go straight into the wholesale distribution and, and beyond. But if you're looking to um, uh, keep your purse strings tight, shall we say, then uh, I'd be looking to go straight to consumer. Lovely. Um, a question here for you, Chris. Uh, you mentioned earlier about like doing a pop up, and then the next stage is is moving into a space. Um, Danny has asked, when starting a street food business, would you say it's essential to trade at markets and festivals beforehand to build up your brand and audience? Uh, not necessarily essential. No, uh, we've had people that you know perhaps have been the first step for them, and and I suppose there's no right or wrong answer. You you definitely do gain experience, and you 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 come with an established brand, but We've had guys that have traded across the country. They've never had permanent homes in Manchester. So even though they've had that sort of build up process, they're still new to Manchester. So it, you don't have to have done it. And I think it goes back to having a unique product. If you think you're going to serve something up that's truly unique and no one else is doing and you believe in it, then um, you can by all means use somewhere like Hatch as, as the test bed um, and, and as the first step. Mm. Fantastic. Um, Rachel Bellows, who Rachel said, Rachel is from, made in Northamptonshire, always like an entrepreneur that promotes their stuff. Um, we have seen a big increase in the, the Buy Local campaign. This is really helpful for small artisan producers. This is something we about now, but do you think this is a trend that will continue in terms of uh, supporting local food businesses? What are your thoughts on the impact of this time on, on the local, Buy Local stuff? Clive, do you want to take that on first? I was asked that question only this morning, um, and uh, it's a real challenge because ethically and morally, it's absolutely correct, and it's also a very good uh, marketing tool as well. And so I thoroughly encourage local as much as possible, um, just for the sustainability angle, if, if, if nothing else, um, the social sustainability. Having said that, as you grow, it becomes more challenging uh, as you as you go grow in volume uh, to buy locally. Um, just purely from a cost perspective, uh, there's been very competitive markets out there internationally and um, as you go into the larger sectors where uh, your margins are going to be squeezed by some uh, competitive retailers perhaps, uh, it then becomes more challenging and more um, difficult to maintain that local contact. But absolutely for as long as possible and certainly it's, 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 an, it's grown. Uh, 15 years ago, it wasn't much of a thing. Now it is, is, is more impactful. I think the younger demographic gets it and promotes it. Um, but sadly, price uh, still is one of the main drivers behind purchasing. And uh, buying local at a, at a premium is okay. Buying local at a very high premium is also okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chris, is, is the buy local thing something you do around the marketing, obviously, to get customers to come, come to Hatch, you know, come and support your, your local businesses? Yeah, I mean, it's through the two ways of looking at local. It's, you know, I mean, for us, is we've got like the, the regions around Manchester as well and shop rather than going into the city centre, are you going to do your shopping locally or, or, or eating out as well? But yeah, support local independent business has always been one of the key messages um, and something that we're keen to put out there. But I think, you know, touching on what Clive said about, you know, habits have changed now out of necessity. And I think there'll be, you know, longer term, habits will stay changed but maybe not quite as drastically as they have been recently and um, so i think people will start spreading their spending across various outlets and businesses rather than you know doing your whole whole weekly shop in one place uh, and, and that's that i think people are gonna continue with what they've done but pay maybe on more of a sort of you know slightly more flexibly lovely um, Amal, uh, again, quite a specific question, but I'm going to read it out. This one for you, Clive. Um, it says, um, hi, a question for Clive. We are a small food business in Brighton. And since COVID, we have been adapting our business to make a couple of our products that we specialize in to sell to local retailers as homemade products, such as hummus and falafel. Should we continue to go down that route or should we be looking at, uh, at manufacturing by another company uh, or keep it homemade and sell it in big retailers. So I guess that's a question around staying local or expanding it, expanding the business. That's the, the eternal question. When to launch from, as I said, this one, two, three stage strategy, when to launch from sort of home production into uh, maybe your own premises 
and um, then getting contract manufacture. The, the more specific the product is and the more specific your ingredients are, the more difficult it is to get a contract manufacturer. If you're, um, if you're making um, hummus, for example, there are plenty, well, say plenty, there are a few um, people I could um, point you in the direction of, uh, of using as contract manufacturers, but there are challenges there. This would be a short life product, short shelf life product. And then you get a dynamic on volume because the shorter the live product, then the, uh, you need to have a, a churn rate in the product coming in every day, every second day. So the volumes go low. If you have an ambient product, then you can you can buy uh, warehouse falls, if you like, uh, and you get drive down good price. So for, for, for a local product, uh, supply the local market, I would suggest that you retain control of your production because your flexibility to change the recipes, to adapt to market conditions, to put new products on will be phenomenal. It is hassle. It is uh, more, exp more expensive as CapEx to, to, to do your own thing. But ultimately, you will have total control of your brand. And um, as, if you're staying in the chill sector, then it's, it's uh, a lot easier in my book, because uh, I've done it so many years, to be making it yourself than it is to get it made from someone else. And also, there's that, a little bit of a dynamic of finding the right partner. Because they've got to have the, right, the same ethos as you. They've got to have the same uh, uh, desires as you. And basically, contract manufacturers, I was one for 16 years, um, they are interested in the size of your wallet. They, <laughs> they want to know that you're well-funded, that, you um, that you, you know, you've got plans going forward. So frustratingly, when you look for a contract manufacturer, if you go down that route, don't expect to be the customer. You're selling people. You're trying to get people to buy into your, your program. When you get big enough, you become the customer. So it's, I don't know the specifics, but right off the top of my head, it sounds like stay local, stay making yourself, and then wait for that, uh, make that decision later down the line when volumes increase to a situation where you can't. Fantastic. That was brilliant. Thanks for that, Clive. Um, We've had a question from Alice who said, for people wanting to build experience in the food industry before starting out on our own, what would you advise given that the hiring market is currently constricted? Um, I don't know if you, any, either of you have got any thoughts on that. But I don't know, maybe Chris, in terms of the businesses that are in your spaces, in terms of, you know, generally, how are they around at the moment around recruitment, taking on new staff? You know, is, there, is, it, is it quite positive? I, mean, I suppose it, it goes back to the point we raised about businesses now having to diversify to adapt to these new conditions. So businesses that never would have considered doing delivery and home ordering and have always been focused on just their, their restaurant spaces are now branching out to do that. And that does require more staff. You know, there's a, there is a higher operational cost there. And, you you know, you'd assume, therefore, that, there's, that there is jobs. And we know that we know that from the guys at Hatch that they're, they are having to take on staff to fulfill these orders, runners to take food from the space to the customers because, you know, we're doing contactless ordering now rather than, you know, at the moment we can't go into these spaces and order at the bar. Um, so I definitely think there's opportunities out there because businesses are having to adapt to these new ways of working. I guess you're right. You could. There's probably a lot of delivery jobs, isn't there, at the moment, and that's probably a really good way to connect with a with a, a food business if you're looking for experience. Yeah, um, so not not solely delivery as well. It's you know it's almost from from kitchen to table delivery yeah. as well, cool. and certainly in these communal dining spaces. Yeah, exactly. Clive, what is that? Is that something you recommend to some people? They've got an idea, but you say actually go and get a job in a food business first, just to sort of learn the trade. They've got an idea they want to launch. Um, no, I don't think, I think if you've got an idea, um, uh, I think it would take too long to, uh, it took me uh, 35 years plus to get where I've got to, so I wouldn't recommend you wait that long. Um, and also, there are so many different disciplines in the industry, um, as we've mentioned before. To, to know, you, to get a generalist knowledge is, is, is going to be, it's going to take a long time. Um, no, I would think you'd have to uh, rely on friends, family, and uh, specialists to, uh, to, to drive your product, get, get your product to market as quickly as possible. Fill the gaps in your knowledge by um, research online, by asking people like me, um, and, and uh, getting help from uh, some people in the industry, some wholesalers that, that might be able to help you. Um, but I think, um, no, I, I wouldn't get practical experience if I had an idea. I, I think by the time you've got it, it would be your practical idea would have been uh, the, the boat would have sailed. Mm. Yeah, good point. 
Uh, Lord Sugar always says you should get a job as uh, before you become an entrepreneur, but you know, let's stop talk about him. Uh, <laughs> Lewis, Lewis has asked, what minimum order quantities are typical for contract manufacturers for a condiments business, for example? Uh, I don't know if that's another one for you, Clive. I guess that's again quite hard to say, but what are your well, thoughts on that? Again, I can't, you can't put a, a number on it, it's, it's very specific. Um, a lot of the minimum order depends on um, how much your condiments fit with the manufacturer that you're getting the products from. If it's in their existing packaging and it, the, the kind of label you want, the labeling machinery, uh, it's in their existing, the whole structure of what they've got, got ingredients in already, um, then the minimum order quantity is going to be significantly lower than if you're having some bespoke packaging of um, some bespoke ingredients that have got to come in. So it's very much on a case by case, excuse the pun, a case by case basis. Um, and, uh, but, the, any most manufacturers will require you to put up a, a, a bond, if you like, an amount of money before you uh, get that product. So you get it. So they've got insurance that they're going to get their money for the FA. So um, it's, it's down to negotiation, and it's down to finding the, the right size of supplier, and it's and it's working out exactly how much of a match your product's going to be to that existing contract manufacturer. So it's all a bit of a game. Uh, again, um, I'm happy to help out trying to find that um, uh, if, if you like to find, to try to find the right kind of um, uh, cubby hole, if you like to put a particular product into. Uh, but it's very much the horses are going to be, um, uh, some of the, the big multinationals, they're not going to get out of bed unless you, unless you put up a quarter of a million quid. But if you go to some smaller suppliers, you might be able to put up 5,000 pounds to get some product. That's yeah. Just, very broad restaurant. Yeah, uh, we're getting quite a few people who both of you actually saying, how can we get in touch with both of you? So I guess uh, LinkedIn is probably a good place to start for both of you. That's a good place to connect. Uh, and obviously head to the, the Brumwood Spark page for lots more information of how you can find out about all the Brumwood stuff. And um, we got lots, lots more questions, some very detailed, but I'm going to try and race through them. Uh, which one are we going to pick? Uh, let's go for... Um, is it a, uh, this is from Fang Yi who has asked, is it a good idea to cooperate with another company? I would like to cooperate with a drinks company to increase my sales. I'm guessing you're both going to say yes on that. Um, Chris, you touched on that about places like Hatch, the ecosystem being really important. Do you see sort of cooperations and partnerships happening between between your businesses? We have done, yeah. Those you know, guys that are only, do, only serving drinks, partnering with food traders to offer deals in that way. And I think it... If it's a case of bringing in someone else's expertise through that collaboration, then that's always a good thing um, because you can learn from that and also, you know, mutually benefit. So absolutely. I guess you'd say yes as well, wouldn't you? Good idea. Massive, massive collaboration only a couple of days ago. Um, a fermented product. If it's customer, a client came in for a fermented product, and rather than set, rather than help them set up a business to make this product. Um, I, I put them in touch with uh, someone who's already making it, had spare capacity, um, and they're now talking about where they should join hand. Um, there's all kinds of things to, to look at, but uh, it makes an awful lot of sense. This company now can spend their money on sales and marketing, getting the product out there, rather than having to build a site. So collaboration at every step of the way you possibly can. Yeah, definitely. Um, Danny is asking an interesting question. How important is sustainability when starting up a new business in today's climate? Uh, that's quite an interesting one. Either of you want to take that one? At one to ten, I say eleven, <laughs> because it, it's a must-have when you go to go to a, a buyer. You've got to have a, a strategy in place. I say got to. It sounds a bit definitive, but uh, you really must do. And it, forget about the the commercial side of it. It's ethically correct too. Everybody should be uh, looking at their own sustainability, their footprint, and doing something to ameliorate that. So I, I'm very, very important. Yeah. I guess you'd agree with that, Chris. Yeah, I think cus customers themselves are becoming much more discerning and, and, and focused on sustainability. And therefore, you know, if you've got a, a choice of places to go to and somebody's bigger on sustainability, then that genuinely is setting people apart at the moment. I think if you're disregarding it, then you're going to fall behind. Mm. Okay. Um, we've had, a, I know these both of you aren't sp market, marketing specialists, but we've had just some, a couple of questions around getting getting, getting, it, getting your product out there uh, for people to know about them around social media and stuff. Um, just based on uh, maybe businesses you work with, Chris, have you got, uh, got any tips on that around the marketing side of it? 
Uh, I, mean, I suppose social media is the key and it's one of the most important things we've seen and building up a almost cult followings. Some of the most successful businesses have got people that will go to them potentially every day of the week, certainly multiple times a week, because they're, you know, they're that obsessive about what they do and their brand and that that message spreads and that love for that particular product spreads through social media. Um, Instagram being the primary driver and I'm not an expert in how to get it right, but you know, you know a good grid when you see it on Instagram and uh, it often means you end up following it and trying it for yourself. Mm, exactly. All right. If I imagine any food business, uh, any platform, they should be on the Instagram, shouldn't they? That's where, that's where the food businesses hang out. Um, I know that's not your area as well, Clyde, but I guess that's the kind of thing you'd say to people as well. Social media is important. Yeah, we, have, um, we take care of the furniture. We take care of um, business strategy from, from start to finish. So um, whilst it's not my particular area of uh, expertise, we clearly need to touch on it. It's a very major part. Um, again, it's it's to fit the wallet. Um, we, we have a kind of a, a small, medium and large approach. Um, often when we put a, a a, a brand strategy together people who might say well my cousin can develop a website or i know someone who can do this so they they, 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 they fill the gap, skills gaps within their own network so they don't want to go to a whole agency and spend silly you know 30k not silly money correct money but 30k on, on developing a, a a brand when they can maybe just spend a few thousand but um it's 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 just something that has to be considered as part of your business strategy it has to be very well formulated it doesn't matter the volume of, um, of marketing PR you do, but it has to be focused and targeted and budgeted. You've got to know what you're doing and when you're doing it and make sure you get it done. Exactly. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, Dina has come back with, around the market research again. Um, you mentioned earlier about knowing your customer and, and looking, looking for them. Uh, can you mention how to start this research? Would it be doing surveys among the target market or testing products? I mean, you touched on that earlier, Clive, about you're in a market, speak to people in the market. Do you want to talk a bit more about maybe more sort of formal surveying of people? If you're making kombucha, it's unlikely that you're going to want to ask uh, six or seven year old school children what they think of kombucha. It's probably, it's probably unlikely you're going to want to ask uh, 70, 75 year old people. So, so you've got a target demographic of uh, maybe between um, 20 and 40. So that's narrowed it down right there. So you're going to ask people who are likely to buy your products. Um, you're going to ask them, you're also going to compare them with what's going on in the market. So as you quite rightly pointed out about the innocent story, and, um, you, can, you can get to set up tasting. So blind tastings are great. Um, and rooms and labels off and uh, so people can identify the bottle and you but as long as you standardize the question so out of the 10 questions you ask you know uh, would you do this again are you is it too sweet or what do you think of it out of one to ten so standardize the questions um but, but also ask the questions on um labeling and and also your brand story as well your brand story, your brand design um ask people in comparison would they buy this rather than this that's always a good thing but don't forget it not only is this informing your business decision, but it's also something you can take to the buyer and say, oh, we've done some market research and you can do, yeah, I'm very happy if you've only got 50 people, you can turn in the percentages and you and the bottom in the small type, you put something size 50 people. So. But um, it, it shows that you, you've not just made, made this because you think it's the right thing to make. It shows that you've had put some science behind it. And it, it, it's so, uh, it is, it's a, you can go a long way into it, deep into it, you can go a little bit into it, but certainly doing some is essential. Mm. Um, it's got a question around, a minute or so left, but um, around making stuff from home and local authority regulations. Lewis has said, what advice would you have for getting our local authority to grant us permission to make the product at home? Have you got any advice on that, Clive, generally around yeah. making food yeah. at home? I'm just finishing a project for a guy doing protein out of his home and his, his, his apartment. And, uh, Legally, has to apply to um, the uh, local authority for a license, and um, as part of that, he has to have done his own risk assessment um, and through to hazard analysis. And he tried, and the uh, environmental health said, "No, sorry, this is just cut and paste off the internet." And he called, he called me in, and we put a, a food safety program together, which is uh, which suits his business. And it's important that, to remember that the law will. Um, it is not definitive in so much that it will allow you your food safety program to be commensurate with the size of your business. 
So you have to give enough that you can have a cogent, proper program that you can manage and has impact on your business without being crazy over the top and spending a lot of money doing it. So it's a fine balance of the two. But you have to support um, a, a risk-based food safety system to the local authorities to get the license to produce. Mm. Fantastic. Well, we've reached 145. They go so quickly, these webinars. You think you've got ages and then before you know it's happened. But just before we go, uh, Chris, you mentioned, did you say that Hatch is fully reopening this weekend? Is that is that the, is that the plan? Yeah. As yeah. of Saturday, the fourth, yeah. Um, so I guess you want local people to head on down in obviously a safe, safe way. <laughs> absolutely, yeah, with social distancing in place, but please do come down. Exactly. Thank you so much, both of you. Great advice and great questions. You, there were some challenging ones, some specific ones. They were brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, lots of you, as I said, were asking how to get in touch with Chris and um, Chris and Clive. Find them on LinkedIn and head to the Bruntwood.co.uk forward slash park for more details of the programme. We've got another webinar next Thursday at one o'clock. And don't forget, if you are a Bruntwood Works customer, you can access um, Spark Advisors. So for one-on-one -on -one business advice from experts and Spark uh, introductions, so you can meet get curated uh, introductions to people that might be able to help you. Well, thank you so much for joining us. All the best with your food and drink businesses. Thanks again, Chris and Clive, and I'll see you next week. Goodbye. Thank you.